So welcome, welcome. My name's Jeannie Rosner. Hopefully, I th I've done my best to try to schmooze with all of y'all who's new here. Can y'all raise your hand if this is your first salon? Oh my God, this is amazing. Awesome, welcome, welcome. So I am the uh, person behind Soul Food Salon. I started this in 2014. This is actually our finishing up our ninth year. So um, I consider my year beginning in September and my end of my year is May. So I take the summer months off, so you probably won't hear from me too much more. Uh, maybe a little bit the rest of May, but June, July, August, unless you're following me on Instagram, you probably won't hear from me. But yeah, so I started this in 2014 and my intention and my goal is to be as healthy as I can be and I'm taking you all with me on that journey. So we hold monthly health and wellness events with various experts in the community or out of town. Um, and we, we do talks and we also do cooking events. And if you want to get on the email list and you want to receive emails about forthcoming events and my Soulful Insights, which is a health and wellness newsletter that we put out a few times a month, you need to go to my website or you can contact me. My website, soulfoodsalon.com, at the very top, there's like a subscribe to our newsletter here and you can just enter your information. I'm pretty active on social media, mainly Instagram. Um, it's, it's at Soul Food Salon, so follow along. My hope is just to inspire us to live healthier lives. I post a lot of recipes, easy recipes, I promise, but mostly plant-focused. Um, and one other thing before I introduce our amazing lecturer is um, each year I partner with a different nonprofit. And the hope is to educate us all on a local nonprofit doing good in our community. Uh, you know, for food insecurity, food education, nutrition education. And this year we are partnered with eatreal.org and we are helping the um, Morgan Hill School District get Eat Real certified. So what, basically what they do is Eat Real goes into the school districts, they assess kind of what is going on in their, in their cafeterias, what kind of food they're giving, how much sugar, how much high fructose corn syrup, et cetera, is in the food and then they they give some recommendations on, you know, these are recipes that you can try. They help them with better access for like regenerative um, meats, perhaps, that are uh, raised by regenerative uh, farmers. So easy to make a donation. I know um, I would love it if you would support me. So far, we've raised a little over $8,000, which is fabulous. My goal was 20000 so super easy to make a donation. You can go on my website, again, soulfoodsalon.com. The main page, the about page, like kind of in the middle, it's like, pretty easy, donate here, and you just click the button and make a donation. So any amount of donation would be fabulous. And again, thank you to those that have already made a donation for me. So today I have the pleasure to introduce to you my dear, dear friend, Annie Fenn. Um, we met five or six years ago. Someone connected us on our Instagram, thought we'd be friends, and we've become fast friends. Our big focus is nutrition education. Annie has taken a bigger, deeper dive in brain health nutrition which we're gonna learn all of about her expertise today. Um, so Annie founded the Brain Health Kitchen, and I believe she'll share with us her story, but it was, it was, the impetus for that was her mom had some cognitive issues, and so that was kind of like, she's like, I'm gonna learn what I can to help her lifestyle-wise to be as brain healthy as possible, and she'll, she'll share her story today. So she has a cookbook that she published um, in January, which after the salon, we will have available behind this screen, it'll go up, and Books Incorporated is behind us, ready to sell them, and Annie will sign them for us. Um, she and I, she's been staying with me uh, the last few days. We've actually been spending our last two weeks together. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, we both cooked uh, or baked for you all today, so you have to taste one of our creations. It's um, the citrus glazed olive oil cake, but in a little, um, muffin version. So they're available there with some brain healthy berries on top of them. And um, so uh, y'all are in for a huge treat. I mean, Annie, Annie is the hardest working person I've ever met. And she takes like complex science and will we'll, we'll distill it to something that we can actually understand and then take forth in our life. So for you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's a huge honor to be here. You know, right after Jeannie and I were acquainted on Instagram, she DM'd me and said, would you come out to Woodside and do a soul food salon? And I think that the last time I was here was 2018. Yeah. And then we did a virtual one during the pandemic. And here we are. I'm so happy to be here. It's so fun to see some, um, some old friends and some new faces. 
Some of you have come to my talks before, and so a little bit of what I'll be sharing with you today might be a review. But when it comes to this science, review is always a little bit good, right? We always need a recap. Um, I also have brand new information. Even if you heard me talk last week at Rancho Puerta, there's new information here that I want to share with you. And the cake, the mini cakes that we made, is actually um, a smaller format version of this um, this almond flour olive oil cake. And we're going to be getting into a little bit about um, how to make recipes and how to cook more brain healthy with easy swaps. They also make them more delicious. That's what we're all about. That's what we're all about. So let's get started. Our topic is brain health mindset, how to use the science of neuroprotective foods in your kitchen and in your life. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I've been on book tour since the end of January. My voice is starting to show some signs of strain. So just let me know if you don't hear me well. Okay, a couple things about me. Um, I live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where this is the, the mountains that I'm missing so much since I've been on the road, but I'll be coming home on Sunday. Um, I practice, like Jeannie said, as an OB-GYN physician for 20 years. I moved to Jackson right from residency. I set up shop. I was solo for seven years. I delivered all the babies. It was an amazingly wonderful, busy time in my life. Um, for the last eight years, I focused on menopause. I decided I wanted to try to sleep a little bit better, and I'd always been interested in menopausal medicine. In fact, when I was a chief resident, I gave a grand rounds on perimenopausal issues, and back then, no one had even heard that word. <laughs> Perimenopause? They're like, what, what is that? Um, so I've been interested in menopause for a long time, and I've been following the literature um, that regarding to HRT and menopause for a very long time. I'm going to share some new things about that with you as well. Um, I went back to school at the age of 45. At this point, I decided I want to do something completely different than medicine. I wanted to use the creative side of my brain. Um, I wanted a more flexible lifestyle. I wanted to indulge my love of food and cooking and learn more about nutrition. So that's what I did. I was very fortunate to be able to go to culinary school. And then when I came back from culinary school, I founded the Brain Health Kitchen as a cooking school. And this all came about because, you know, number one, I was learning about the Alzheimer's epidemic that was growing. Um, my mom was showing signs of cognitive decline, and I was already doing some dementia prevention classes through my local hospital. Um, but the data that I'm going to share with you today really started gelling around 2013, 2014. By 2015, I was just like, I ha really had one of those epiphanies where people need to know about this. There's so much you can do with diet, nutrition, lifestyle to reduce your risk of cognitive decline, not just Alzheimer's, but like age-related cognitive decline, that I felt like it was something that everyone should know about. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, this is my actual kitchen window in Jackson Hole, and my, um, my favorite moose cookie that, that comes by often. So I have a cooking school. I have a, it's grown to be a newsletter community, which I enjoy very much. Um, the book just came out in January, and I also offer week-long brain health retreats around the world. Okay, places like Panama, Italy, um, I teach in Mexico, things like that. Yeah, so that's, that's what's been keeping me so busy, as Jeannie says. My ambition is to help you take care of your brain while eating delicious food. I think we're living in an amazing age where healthy food doesn't have to be boring. Healthy food doesn't have to be like cardboard. You know, we can re we've really changed the way we think about healthy food, and that's what I try to do in my cooking classes. I want the food to be really crave-worthy. I want people to just like fall in love with it, um, just like any other food that you would want to serve. But I also want it to nourish and protect their brains as well. And I want people to change their attitudes around food. Once you start to look at food through the lens of brain health, you really, you really approach cooking and eating completely different. Um, that's my goal when I have come, people come to my classes. And these are some of the amazing, amazing students. Um, this was a pediatrician for my kids. When, first thing he did after he retired was go through my course. <laughs> so today we have kind of a big agenda, so I'm going to um, indulge your attention for a little while. I want to talk a little bit about Brain Aging 101. This is sort of a real Cliff's Notes on Alzheimer's, what we think it is, what we think it is, etc. We're going to talk about the brain health mindset, which is very important. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on what's new in brain protective diets, such as the Mediterranean diet, such as the MIND diet. I've spoken and written about these things extensively, and some of you probably already aware of these diets, but we'll, we'll hit the high notes, and I'll tell you what's new. Uh, we're going to talk about menopause in the brain. Anybody interested in that topic? Okay. There is some new stuff, which I'm very excited about. I'm going to give you some practical tips for you to take home for your own cooking. I imagine some of you like to cook, some of you maybe not, but we all have to eat, we all have to prepare food. Um, I'm going to give you some homework. Right? Because it's great to come to a talk, but it's even better 
if you take a nugget home and then just really try to fold that into your life. That's how uh, positive change is made. And then we're going to leave lots of time for Q&A, okay? And I warn you, sometimes my talks make people hungry, because I like to use a lot of food photos. This is called Your New Favorite Kale Salad. We made this at Rancho La Puerta. I don't know if you remember Marion or anyone else who was in my class. It's got a, a blueberry shallot dressing. It's one of my favorite ways to eat blueberries. OK, a lot of stuff on this slide. We're going to go through it kind of quickly. And we're gonna, I'm going to answer your questions right away so that we have some understanding before we move on. Um, a lot of terminology gets thrown around when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So dementia is basically the umbrella term for cognitive decline that occurs with age. It's not a normal thing. It's a pathological thing. Okay? There are several causes of dementia. Of that, Alzheimer's is like 70%. Okay? That's why you hear so much about Alzheimer's. It's the most common type of dementia. And it also has diagnostic criteria. So people can study it. Researchers can study it. They can look at amyloid and tau and all these other proteins, MRIs, PET scans. You know, we have these biomarkers. So it's something that can be studied in such a way that we're building research and building our knowledge about it. Um, we don't really know exactly what causes Alzheimer's disease. Okay? But what it's starting to come down to is that the root cause seems to be chronic inflammation. No surprise, right? Is that like the root cause of pretty much everything with aging diseases? Um, so there have been a lot of interest in beta amyloid plaques, right? We know about amyloid because pharmaceutical countries are targeting amyloid um, to find drugs to cure Alzheimer's, which, you know, they're kind of on the way to do that, but there's been a lot of failures and a lot of disappointments and billions and billions and billions of dollars spent on it. Um, so that's how we all know what beta amyloid is. That's the purple picture. Those are the little proteins that get stuck in the brain and form plaques. Um, tau tangles is another abnormal protein uh, that happens in the brain. It's also very important in women, as we're finding. Um, women tend to have more of a tauopathy than an amyloid one. Um, brain volume is incredibly important when it comes to brain research. Now we can look at brain MRIs. And I'll go into this slide a little bit more. But this shows um, dietary patterns impact on your brain volume. So as you get older, your brain shrinks. I hate to tell you that. It's kind of like, you know, as you get older, you lose a little bit of height, right? I'm about a half an inch shorter than I was when I was 25. It doesn't matter how much I work out. It doesn't matter how much calcium I consume. I'm still going to lose a little bit of height, right? It's kind of inevitable. The same thing happens with brain volume. But we work out and we eat calcium and we eat well because we, do, we don't want to lose height. We want to keep our bones strong. It's the same thing with brain volume. You know, there's things you can do to mitigate that loss of volume over time. And brain volume is so important because, you know, it's white matter, it's gray matter, it's all these structures in the brain, it's neurons, it's synapses, but it's also memories. You know, it's your intellectual capital. It's all the things that you've learned in your life that you're holding in your brain that you can retrieve later when you need it. We call this cognitive reserve. It's a really important concept in Alzheimer's prevention. You know, building cognitive reserve by doing intellectually difficult things is one way you can uh, make your brain more resilient to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so brain volume is key, and now we're starting to see very large studies looking at MRI data saying, you know, well, what makes the brain shrink, and what makes it shrink at a faster rate, and what, what are people doing to hold on to their brain volume with time? That's why brain volume is so important. It's a very exciting part. Um, another biomarker is synaptic dysfunction. Um, that's how we communicate. You may know that in Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, people basically lose connections between different parts of their brain. You know, so their cognitive function is lost and their memory center is lost. Um, cognitive decline is the clinical focus. You know, when you go to your doctor and you get a cognitive test, I don't know if any of you have done that. I actually enrolled in a study last year, so I got to go through a battery of tests where they asked you to count backwards by 100 by sevens. Um, they ask you to do some complex tasks drawing, things like that. It's very, believe me, it's very nerve-wracking. It's very stressful. Um, so that's another way we can look at it. Um, so as our brains age, we are developing biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is not something that someone gets when they turn 80 and, you know, they have to go into memory care. Um, that's a very unusual presentation that someone just kind of goes off a cliff, although it does happen. Usually what happens is it's a process, okay? Alzheimer's disease starts 20 years before the first symptoms. Some researchers are saying 30 years. Okay. So it's a different way to think about it than maybe we've thought about it in the past. Okay. Do I have any questions right now? Yes. I think it's interesting because 
Alzheimer's <coughs> diagnosis often was on autopsy. Mm -hmm. And now with all the biomarkers, that, so, that, yeah. so they're, now they're doing the diagnosis well, if someone is alive. Yeah, autopsy is the best way to diagnose Alzheimer's, like a lot of things. Um, but it's gone from a clinical diagnosis of like, oh, someone who fails their cognitive test, to one that is more biomarker driven, like PET scans, detecting amyloid in the cerebral spinal fluid, um, MRI data, looking at brain volume. Yeah, so the, the criteria actually just changed the last few years. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of a, I don't have too many sciencey slides. <laughs> Most of them have really pretty food pictures, but um, I want you to hang in there and look at this one with me. It's not that complicated. We talked about all these biomarkers, amyloid, synaptic dysfunction, tau, brain shrinkage, all of these things. Um, think about you know, this, your brain aging over a continuum, okay? On this axis, this is normal. So these are like our 20-something-year-old children or you know, young adults. Um, Preclinical. This, this is middle age. Middle age is 45 to 65. Uh, I would submit that we're all probably in this preclinical, which means we don't have any symptoms at all, but we do have some amyloid and tau and other things building. It's just under the, way, way under the radar, okay? Um, when it tips over into mild cognitive impairment, that's when you start to get memory loss. That's when it first becomes apparent. Uh, with my mom, it was getting lost. She would pick me up at the airport. I would think I was a resident or in medical school, um, and she would get lost going to the mall you know, like someplace that she could easily drive to. That's a really, really common first symptom of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then, you know, it's overt dementia. So the whole point with this is that, you know, you're not going, <laughs> we're not going right to here with all of these things. Yes, Katrine. Where's losing worse? Like, because uh, <laughs> I feel like all of my friends <laughs> and I are, are in that phase. Should we start, should we talk about menopause right now? <laughs> um, it can be part of mild cognitive impairment, but it can be normal. There are many, many memory impairments that are normal and not secondary to MCI. One really important thing I need to tell you is that we call this MCI, mild cognitive impairment. 15% of MCI is reversible, okay? So if you think you have MCI, which is called subjective cognitive decline, like you're like, God, I'm just not sharp anymore. I would always remember that and I'm not remembering it. Um, you know, go see someone, get screened for sure. If you have early onset of Alzheimer's, you need to know that because there's interventions that you can access. Um, but 15% of the times, these are reversible. They're not Alzheimer's. They are anxiety, they're depression, they're sleeplessness, it's menopause. It might be an alcohol use disorder or some sort of other disorder. Those are the really common ones. Okay. Menopause is a big one. Yes. So if you did go see someone for the biomarkers for MCI, it would be a neurologist? If you can get in to see a neurologist, fabulous. And then what kind of test would you ask for? You just say you wanna, I, I just, I want I'm here to talk about my brain health. This is what I'm noticing. This is what my partner might be noticing. I'm worried about getting Alzheimer's. Um, maybe I have it in my family, or maybe I have a risk factor that I've identified. I wanna be tested to see if, um, you know, what's going on with my brain. Anything? They might do a cognitive test. Um, if you have a, a very strong family history, they might do a blood test and some other things. And can I add that here in the Bay Area, there's an amazing free resource. It's the Stanford um, VA Alzheimer's Research Center. They do free screenings. Oh, fantastic. Because getting in to see the neurologist is the hard part. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah. It's so hard. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Sally. This is Sally Duplantier. We're going to introduce her in a minute. Um, she's a great resource for all of you. So does this make sense to people? I, I don't look at this as, I'm an optimist to my default. I don't look at this as pessimistic. I look at this as like, wow, we have all this time to take care of our brains. And there's known things that we can do to reduce all those biomarkers. There are, there's so much that we can do to reduce it. So I'm not of the thinking that we're all getting Alzheimer's all the time. Let's just you know, drink Coke and you know, do whatever we want, who cares? <laughs> Um, I'm like, wow, we've got, there's so much we can do. This is modifiable. Okay. All right, brain health mindset. There's a big section in my book about this, so I think it's so important. The why. Like, how do you change, how do you change the way you eat? How do you change your exercise patterns? How do you, um, 
you start a stretch routine. I was down at Rancho Puerto with some of you, and I have a new stretch routine that I'm doing every single day, and I'm really happy about it. It's very hard to change patterns of behavior. Okay, so I go through this a lot in my cooking school. How do you implement a brain-healthy diet? And I think of the mindset as just approaching aging proactively. And when you think about your brain as something you need to protect and nourish, it makes it a lot easier to make good food choices. And I'm sure you all eat really well. We're all on different you know, journeys of, of how we eat and how well we eat. Um, most people I meet that come to my class are actually really good eaters. I'm very impressed with the way I eat. But we all have something that we can improve upon, even me, every single one of us. Okay, so number one, start with a purpose. I mentioned my mom before. This is my mom in the gardens at Rancho La Puerta. Um, there has to be, you know, what is your why? Why do you want to take care of your brain? When I think about it for myself, I think of my sons who are 22 and 25. I think it, maybe someday they'll get married and have children. Um, I want to be like a really cool active grandma. Like I want to take the grandkids to Africa. Like I've never done that. Like I have these things I want to do. If I have a granddaughter, I want to take her to Paris. So my why is that when I am like 80 and 90, I want to be traveling with the grandkids. Maybe there's great grands. I don't even know. Um, but I want to be active. And I also know that exercise is such a big part of my life that if I couldn't go for a walk or take a hike or ride my bike, I'd be really sad. So I have these, you know, I have these reasons. Um, and I see what it's doing to my mom, and I see how it deteriorates the family. You know, a person doesn't get Alzheimer's. A whole family gets Alzheimer's. And so you all know this, right? We're all getting touched by this now. And so this is my why. You have to start with a purpose. It doesn't have to be just one thing, but it's good if you can zo zoom in on one thing. Embracing a clean slate. This is, means, you know, what if you have a big birthday? Like you just turned 50 or just turned 40. Um, or what if you're an empty nester and you can finally go through the snack cupboard and get rid of all the junk? What are you going to put in that snack cupboard? Right? That's a clean slate. Um, maybe you have a health scare. Maybe you were diagnosed with cancer or heart disease or something like that, and now you've got a clean bill of health and you worked really hard and had a lot of treatments. Now what do you do? What do you do going forward? Be a brain health ambassador. That means I'd like to challenge every single person who comes to a talk or a cooking class to take what they learn and share it with everyone you love. Because this is the only way information gets out there. Okay, it's really the, it's really the only way. We all have like a, you know, our own sphere of influence, and they say it's probably like at least 1,000 people. Um, but that's powerful. That's powerful. Um, being a brain health ambassador might be, you might be the one to serve this hibiscus lime sangria when you have friends over, so that when people come over, they're not immediately drinking alcohol, which we'll talk about. Um, you're offering a non-alcoholic drink. That's a way of being a brain health ambassador. That's telling your friends, I care about your brains, and we're going to have this, and then if you want some wine, I'll give you some wine too. <laughs> Control your environment. We were talking about this recently. Was it you just, you and me? Oh, was it my class last night in the city? We're talking about willpower is really not a thing. Like our, the social scientists are learning through studies that we think we should be able to resist things like potato chips that are in the snack cupboard. It's not true. Nobody can resist that. Or if like your cheese drawer in the refrigerator is full of the types of cheese you absolutely love, like brie and pecorino and you know all these manchego, like all your favorites. Every time you walk by the kitchen, you're going to want to have a piece. So willpower is a myth. So you can't really rely on it. You can't feel bad about yourself. You just can't really rely on it. Um, so I like to say control your environment. And part of that is cleaning out you know, the ultra-processed foods and the foods that we know are brain harming from your immediate area. You know, your kitchen, your office, your car, all those things. Progress over perfection. You've heard this before, right? This is not about being perfect. It's not about eating a perfect diet. I don't eat a perfect diet at all. Um, but you know, I'm always trying, I'm always striving, and I would say if I hit it right 90% of the time, I'm feeling really good. 90, 95% of the time is great. I've been traveling a lot, and I'm just doing my best. You know, just doing best. We're all just doing our best. So making focus on making progress rather than I'm going to be the most perfect brain healthy eater. Just starting today, you know, you just set yourself up for failure sometimes. Track weekly, not daily. They did this in the Mind Diet study. They do this in a lot of studies that we'll talk about. Day, it's like weighing yourself daily, you know, it's just really not a good thing. <laughs> um, there's too many, too many um, data points there that, you know, you need to fluctuate. So weekly progress, and the way I think of my weekly progress is I look at my, my shopping cart when I'm checking out. You know, is it colorful? Is there very few packaged food products? Um, is it mostly fruits and vegetables and beans and things like that? Um, that's sort of my litmus when I'm checking out. You know, that's my weekly, my weekly check-in. 
celebrate positive changes, ask yourself this one question. I think we all know enough about what makes, what, which foods are good for us and which ones aren't. I'm gonna go into detail in the neuroprotective foods, which is sort of a different category, but I think we all kind of have an idea, like this food is not good for you, right? I guess the extreme would be a hot dog, you know? <laughs> um, and then, you know, these foods are good for you, like a beautiful kale salad, like I showed you. And then there's foods in the middle, like the olive oil cake that we made, is that good for you? Or is that like a treat? Or is that somewhere in the middle? Um, but I think we all know, if you're faced with a food choice, looking at a restaurant menu or something, I think we all have enough knowledge to say, is this brain healthy? No, no. Grocery shop with a brain health mindset. Okay, any questions about that? Anything you wanna add? Brain protective diets. I don't know if you've heard that term before. Uh, brain protective diets are the diets that are dietary patterns that are studied to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, okay, other neurodegenerative diseases. And there are several. You know, the Mediterranean diet, which is the pyramid here, I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's largely a plant-based diet. There's a prominence of fish and seafood. There's less animal products like meats and dairy. Um, there's red wine, famously enjoyed with it. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. It's focused on eating around the table, friends and family, being active, drinking a lot of water, um, being social, basically. Okay, so the Mediterranean diet has been studied forever. Um, the, first data, the first studies we have based on cognition and dementia prevention is from the Mediterranean diet. The MIND diet, who's heard of the MIND diet here? Yay, good. So this is a new concept for some of you. The MIND diet, as I'll show you, is a spin-off of the Mediterranean diet to be more brain-specific. It's a brain-specific Mediterranean diet. Um, vegetarians, of course, have been studied for years. Vegans, we're starting to get better studies on whole food plant-based diets and how they pertain to the brain. Um, there's a new diet called the Green Med Diet. Has anyone heard of this data? Sally has. Um, fascinating, Jeannie. Um, we'll go into that a little bit because it's super interesting. There's some take-home messages. And then there's another way to think of nourishing a brain by looking at um, flavanol-rich foods. Okay, flavanols are nutrients in plants that make them colorful, okay? And there's a large body of data now that shows that flavanol-rich foods are very good for our brains. So we're gonna go into some of the data behind these, especially some of the new stuff. So we know that the Mediterranean dietary pattern reduces brain shrinkage with age. That first, that first slide I showed you of the MRIs, that was study, one of the initial studies done by Dr. Lisa Moscone at Weill Cornell. She's a neuroscientist that studies Alzheimer's in women. And what she found was that people that follow a Mediterranean diet, they have bigger, lusher, more voluminous brains as they age than people that follow a standard American diet. The Mediterranean diet followers had twice the brain volume as those from a standard American diet. And her initial study was a few hundred MRIs, which is good, good solid data. It's been replicated in two other large studies one was over 800 MRIs. So we know that your dietary pattern impacts your brain volume. And like I said, brain volume is everything, so that's super important. We know the Mediterranean diet reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke. Now you've probably heard that what's good for the heart is good for the brain, okay? So everything you've learned about taking care of your heart and not having a heart attack and lowering your cholesterol and staying at a healthy weight and exercising, not smoking, all of these things are pertinent to brain health. Because even though 70% of dementia is Alzheimer's, Half of Alzheimer's also has vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is from unhealthy blood vessels. Is from what? Unhealthy blood vessels. Yeah. So there's this huge overlap. Nothing in medicine is ever really black and white. That's why we love it so much, right? Um, we know that the Mediterranean diet reduces amyloid plaque and tau tangles in the brain. This is new data that came out in March. I don't know if you heard, like, whenever the Mediterranean diet's on the Today Show or People are talking about it again. It's because a new study came out. And I'll share that study with you. There's that same MRI. I think it's just a really powerful way to think about what you eat and how your brain ages. Um, and I just wanted to mention too, you know, the Mediterranean diet is the most studied one, thanks to you know, the walnut industry in Spain and the red wine industry in Europe and the olive oil industry, my gosh. Um, but there are other dietary patterns that have been identified. This is the Asian dietary pattern, this is the Latin American one, this is the African Heritage Dietary Pyramid. They look really similar, don't you think? This is not what these groups are eating nowadays, this is going back a couple of generations, looking at what their grandparents ate. Just like the Mediterranean diet, it's not 
like what my parents ate. It's what my grandparents and great parents, the way they ate. So these studies haven't had the kind of funding and interest that the Mediterranean diet has. So I don't ever want to um, have people think that because I, rec I think the Mediterranean diet is so great because it does all these, you know, it's been proven to reduce you know, Alzheimer's risk. It doesn't mean that these won't either. Um, this comes down to the concept of fit. You know, people should dig, dig deep into what food means to them, what it means for their family, their culture, um, their ancestors. You know, what is a dietary pattern that fits with your life that's going to be a sustainable way of eating? Because we're not talking about a diet. We're talking about lifetime changes, right? And so these are all can be very powerful brain-healthy diets, I believe, if only they were studied. Okay, the Mayan diet. This is Dr. Martha Claire Morris from Russian University. Um, I got to know her a little bit when the Mind Diet came out. What she did, she was a, she's a nutritional epidemiologist, now passed. Um, she was studying nutrition, how it affects the brain for 20 years. When she asked the question, okay, the Mediterranean diet is so good for the brain. What if you changed it a little bit? Because she had studied, she published papers that fish and seafood is really good for the brain. Berries are really good for the brain. And leafy greens have bioactive substances that are incredibly good for the brain. This was like the earliest flavonoid research. So she, what she and her colleagues did is they divided that pyramid into 10 brain-healthy food groups and five food groups to limit or avoid. This was the original Mind Diet study that came out in 2015. Um, roughly, these are the 10 brain-healthy food groups. She made berries their own food group. Instead of having like fruits and vegetables all lumped in a pile at the bottom of the pyramid, she's saying, you need to eat berries twice a week, because we have data on women especially that they do better on cognitive tests when they consume that amount of berries. So she's looking at dose and being very specific with recommendations. This is one way it differs. Um, she took leafy greens out of that pile of vegetables and made it its own food group, OK? Because leafy greens have all this data behind them that are just complete, complete, total no-brainers. Um, other vegetables as a food group, nuts, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil as a primary cooking oil, and she included red wine up to five ounces a day as a nod to the Mediterranean diet. Okay. And what was even more specific than the Mediterranean diet is she created these five food groups to limit or avoid. And I believe I'm sharing the PDF with all of you too. Oh, yeah. So feel free to take photos. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. But I'll, I'll be giving you the whole slide deck. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can share. You can be brain health ambassadors and share with people. <laughs> um, so one is fried and fast food. Fewer than a serving a week. Again, there's a dose. She's not saying you can never have fried food again. You will never have a french fry the rest of your life because you're eating brain healthy now. It's like, you know what? Less than once a week. We know it's bad. Less than once a week at the most. Limiting red meat, less than four servings a week. The portion size of three ounces is very small. You know, it's not the typical American ones. It's like a deck of cards. Um, butter and margarine, less than a tablespoon a day. That didn't go over very well at the class I gave last night. One woman just put her head down on the table and just started crying. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't want to tell you about cheese. <laughs> cheese, less than two servings a week. The original Mind Diet study is actually one serving. She upped it in the follow-up study. Pastries and sweets, less than five a week. So, um, yeah, being, what, did, what, are, what are we doing here when we're recommending that we limit these foods? What's the dietary component we're driving down? Saturated fat. Saturated fat, exactly. These are high in sat fat. And we know that you, your cholesterol, your blood cholesterol doesn't go up because you eat a lot of um, cholesterol in foods. We know that's not true, except for a small subset of people. We know that cholesterol goes up because you, people have high saturated fat in their diet plus maybe a genetic predisposition. So sat fat is really important to drive down. You know, the brain healthy diet is not low in fat whatsoever. It's, you know, it's really rich in monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats like you get from fish, but it's less than 5% saturated fat. So what, she, what they were doing is they took this cohort of people in Chicago, almost 1,000 people, they're driving down their LDL cholesterol basically. And the higher your LDL, the greater your risk of Alzheimer's. Okay, it's a really important concept. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, so we're taking away those foods that can predispose you to vascular dementia and then also Alzheimer's. So what was the result of the Mind Diet study? Well, even the researchers were completely blown away by the results. Um, those who followed the Mind Diet most closely after four and, just four and a half years, they had 53% less Alzheimer's disease. 
So granted, these people had healthy brains in the study. You, you, if you had any dementia or cognitive decline, you couldn't get into the study. They were tested rigorously. These are people with healthy brains between the ages of like 65 and 95. Okay? So they're entering age groups where they are likely to get Alzheimer's in the next few years, especially the older ones. 53% um, reduction. So that's remarkable because you know, <coughs> up until then, 2015, there is no dietary intervention like this ever. There's no drug, there's no, there's no nothing. We don't have a, a pill for Alzheimer's, we don't have a cure for it. We don't really know exactly how to deal with Alzheimer's disease. But now we're saying we can slash the risk in half in just four and a half years. Yes? What's the average age of onset for Alzheimer's? Um, for late onset Alzheimer's, it's in the 70s. Oh, okay, early. But, but if, you're, if you're 65, your lifetime risk is around one in nine. Oh, okay. If you're 85, your risk is one in two. Wow. Yeah. And it's different for men and women, which we'll talk about. Yes? Is it higher in the U.S. than elsewhere? This is happening everywhere. Wow. It's happening. What's happening in the U.S. is also happening globally. Um, and another, I'm sorry? Just to clarify those statistics, um, one in nine if you're 65 and one in two if you're 85, mm -hmm. is that for Alzheimer's or dementia? That's for Alzheimer's disease. There's Alzheimer's, yeah. So dementia is going to be more. And it's more if you're female, too. Those are crazy statistics. They're crazy statistics, and they go up every single time the Alzheimer's Association does their facts and figures, which is a document that's highly researched. The numbers change every single time. Every time I do a slideshow, I, I have to change it each year because the numbers are going up. I didn't want to show you the graph. I've got a lot of slides, but the graph is like, you know. It's like, it's like oh my god. Um, the important thing about this, too, is that you know, the people didn't follow the MIND diet that closely. They still had a 35% risk reduction. So remember, progress over perfection. There's even small changes. Even changing one food group, like eating more leafy grains, has shown to reduce risk. So this is super important. This is the newest stuff about the MIND diet. So it's been replicated in other countries, which is wonderful. There's a big study in Australia that basically got the exact same results. You know, because nutrition studies are tough. They're observational. There's dietary questionnaires. You know, they, they can be hard to pull off. Um, this data just came out last year. We now know that following the MIND diet reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease, especially in women. You know, Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease that often leads to dementia. People will live with Parkinson's for a long time, though. So having, finding something that can actually reduce the risk or reduce the, how it deteriorates is amazing. And look at these numbers. 7.4 years reduction of onset in men, pushing it off by seven years. And in women, 17 years. You know, more men than women get Parkinson's. Um, but this, is, this was an incredible paper. It needs to be replicated. But we're starting to see data like this that the MIND diet also helps with other neurodegenerative diseases, right? Because Alzheimer's is not the only one. Um, another paper came out showing that it reduces the risk of breast cancer by 50%. Do we know any diet that's been proven to reduce breast cancer? I mean, how come that's never been studied? <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling, but the MIND diet put up really good numbers. Again, this is one study that came out last year. It needs to be replicated. Yeah, I'm unclear what the difference is between, I know you said it, but between the MIND diet and the Mediterranean diet, is it that the MIND diet has these um, portions? Is that the main difference? So in, in all these studies, the MIND diet has a scale, and you end up with a, a, like a report card number um, based on how you adhere to the diet. Did you eat whole grains? Did you eat beans? Did you eat fish? Did you eat ultra-processed food? You know, that's a negative. Um, and the MIND diet has its own scoring system. The highest number you can get is 15. So it's very precise. It's based on weekly dietary guidelines The people, you know, but they actually were very engaged with their participants, and they did very intense cognitive testing. So the, the, the data is very reliable. Um, the difference is, is, you know, they had the berries, the leafy greens, and they were very precise about cutting back on the saturated fat foods. In the Mediterranean diet, they say, you know, emphasis on whole foods over ultra-processed ones, mm -hmm. which is great, but it's, people need numbers. Um, reducing the risk of open angle glaucoma by 80%, reducing the risk of dying from any cause, if you want like a really good number, 37% <laughs> reduced risk of dying of any cause. Um, really important, this summer you might see the MIND diet in the news again. The, the MIND diet is now a randomized controlled trial. 300 people on the MIND diet, 300 people um, doing some other similar thing that nobody knows. It's blinded. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, the participants don't know what they're being studied for. And those results are finally finished, delayed from COVID, but they'll be coming out this July. 
So that's going to be a really powerful study because of the design. Yeah. Your cookbook, is that follow the MIND diet or the Mediterranean diet? Well, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> I thought I was following the MIND diet, and then you know, I, I added some other things. So I'll show you how my, my brain health pyramid differs a little bit. Yeah. OK, really quickly, the Green Med diet, yet again, it's a spin-off of the Mediterranean diet. This one comes out of Israel. Someone told me that in Israel, there's not a lot of berries. So they're not using berries to increase the antioxidant content of the diet. What they're doing is they're taking the standard Mediterranean diet and then boosting it with three to four cups of green tea a day, which you all know is really good for you, right? Quarter cup of walnuts and a green shake made with a, a little microgreen just to standardize it. They ask everyone to eat less meat, especially processed meat. They give everyone a gym pass, okay? <laughs> A gym pass. Could the green tea be the decaffeinated version? I, I believe not. I haven't found good data on that, but I believe the decaffeination process um, block, you know, it takes out the ECGC, which is the catechin that's really important. So the conclusion, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but um, regular exercise plus this green med diet boosted with polyphenol rich foods, they had really good brain MRI data. These people's brains shrunk at a slower rate than the people who didn't boost it with these polyphenol-rich foods. So polyphenols are a type of flavanols that we're going to talk about. So <laughs> I've been drinking a lot more green tea since this study came out. <laughs> and um, a perfect example of brain health mindset, um, Katrine was at Rancho La Perta when I was talking about this. And at dinner that night, she's like, you know what? I'm someone who eats walnuts now. <laughs> I'm a person that eats walnuts. That's brain health mindset. That's a perfect, perfect example of it. Have you seen people intolerant of that much tea, green tea? Yeah, not everyone can drink that much green tea. Uh -huh. I don't drink three to four cups. But I, I, really, I figure that one cup of matcha is like two cups of green tea because uh -huh. it's got more Because the GI side effects are bigger than it, even the caffeine-related. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's cultures of people that, you know, some people just drink it all day long. Yeah. Does jasmine tea count at all? Uh, Jasmine, I don't think so. Is Jasmine green? Yeah. Yeah, then it counts. It does? Yeah. Yeah, the teas, the teas that are real teas are the white, the oolong, the black, and the green. And of the green, there's green tea, of which there's jasmine, pearls, or something. And then there's matcha. If ja Jasmine is green tea, right? But no, because tea is made out of camellia Yeah, so camellia sinensis is the plant. From that plant, you get white, black, oolong, and green. And then there's herbal teas, which of course are not really tea. They're herbal tinctures, like hibiscus, chamomile, yeah. you name it. Yeah. Did I, well. Does that answer the question? <laughs> okay, flavanols. I told you flavanols are what make foods colorful. It's what makes plant foods colorful. So that same group at Rush, Dr. Tom Holland, who's like a really wonderful, wonderful person, he asked the question, okay, we have this cohort of people from the Mind Diet study. We're still studying them. We're studying them ongoing for many, many decades. What if we looked at their diet through the lens of flavanols? You know, forget Mind Diet scores. Forget Mediterranean diet scores and pyramids. Let's just look at foods that we know are rich in these bioactive substances, and let's see how they age and whether or not it impacts their Alzheimer's risk. And lo and behold, what they found was that certain flavanols, flavanol is a subclass of flavonoids, so I kind of go back and forth, um, can reduce risk by 50% with the camphorols, 38% with these other types. Almost the same, same you know, numbers as the MIND diet. It's very consistent, very consistent. Yes? Is chocolate on that list? <laughs> it's on my list. We'll talk about that. We can talk about that. It's, it's, it's kind of a long answer. Tea, but not quite jasmine, flavanols, not quite chocolate. Cocoa, you have to eat a lot of chocolate to get a medicinal dose of cocoa flavanols. Sweet! You have to eat a lot of chocolate. Okay, this is brand new research. This, was, this came out this year, I think it was in March. My friend Tom Holland, group at Rush, they're amazing. Then they ask the question, so what about now? Like, what if you're not worried about getting Alzheimer's later? What if you're like one of those living in the moment people, right? You're not worried about the future. Um, what does eating a flavonoid-rich diet do for your memory? So they studied five different memory parameters, episodic memory, working memory, executive function, executive function speed. These are all the things we rely on constantly, right? Going through our busy, um, hectic, um, multitasking lives. <laughs> 
And, you know, and this is when we start to feel failure. Like, I can't retrieve that word, or he just told me that phone number, and I didn't write it down, and now it's gone. You know, that's working memory. All of these things are things that we rely on every single day and that we feel slipping away as we get older. Um, and lo and behold, there's a significant increase in all of these parameters, every single one of them, especially executive function with a flavonoid-rich diet. Executive function is like that ability to get stuff done. It's like, like Jeannie, for example, is amazing executive function. <laughs> you know, she says, I'm gonna, she's like, I'm gonna go to little, like five minutes later, it's like, how did you do all these things in five minutes? Executive function speed. You know people like that, right? That's how we want to be with healthy brains as we age. These are some of the flavonoids of interest. Crescetin is one of them. You'll notice some Mediterranean foods that we don't eat so much around here, maybe capers, which I'm a big fan of. Um, you know, tomatoes, of course. Uh, red onions in other cultures, like Latin American cultures, a lot of people will be eating red onions raw. We don't do that so much in the US. Um, these are some of the other ones just of interest. This, this flavonoid data was, was replicated at Harvard by Walter Willett, a very, very well-known nutritionist. And he looked at subject, subjective cognitive decline. That subjective is the one where like, gosh, I just can't remember this anymore. What's wrong with me? I'm only 55 and I just like, feel like I'm losing my memory. He tested those people. So I'll you know, be like, maybe all of us. <laughs> and, and he found improvements in all those parameters in the ones that have flavonoid rich diet, yes. No, I like to say eat all the different colors because what, these are the ones that have been studied, like quercetin has been studied extensively, but there are also flavonoids in yellow and white onions. Um, on the um, because that's a quercetin, because it's, they're studying these certain flavonoids. These are the flavonoids of interest oh. that they used in the study. And of course, every fruit and vegetable has their own complement. Okay, the there are literally thousands of flavonoids. It's not, it's not just a matter of substituting any or they're all good. No. No. I, I would say eat a diversity of different colors of plant foods to get all the flavonoids. Don't try to get it all from chocolate just because we like chocolate, <laughs> because you have to eat two, two basically pans of brownies to get a daily dose of flavanol that will impact your memory. You know, that's, it's, it's been studied. That's why there's cocoa via. Um, so the, the, the take home message is eat a variety, but these are the ones that are of interest that are being studied. Okay, so this just came out. This was what was on the news a couple months ago on the Today Show, whatever. The Mediterranean mind diet reduced amyloid and tau in the brain. A lot of the studies with nutrition have been looking at, does someone get Alzheimer's? Um, how do they do cognitively? How do they behave? You know, how, how do things, how do they age? Do they age successfully? But now with the MIND diet, participants are getting older and some of them are passing away and they've donated their brains to science. So this is looking at the MIND diet people who actually pass away and they're looking at their adherence to Mediterranean versus MIND diet and they're actually showing these diets do have an impact on the brain. There's less amyloid and less tau and that they're different. The MIND diet reduces tau protein accumulation more than the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet reduces amyloid accumulation more which doesn't mean one is better, they're just working in different ways, which is really exciting, because we want to hit Alzheimer's prevention from all different areas. So there's going to be more studies like this, which are very exciting and um, you know, more definitive when it comes to nutrition studies. OK. Sorry, wait, that was really fast. Was it yes. they, each of those diets reduced both or not reduced? They both reduced amyloid and tau to some degree. The Mediterranean diet reduced amyloid better than the MIND diet, which is not to say it's like really mm -hmm. better. Um, tau, the tau proteins seem to be less in the MIND diet followers. They had all these little subsets of people too, like, you know, what about men versus women? What about people that carry the ApoE4 genetic mutation for Alzheimer's versus non-carriers? Some of these subsets were not statistically significant based on the data size of participants. Um, but when you dive into this paper, and I recommend reading it if you're interested, you can see all these differences in men versus women like men did better if they had more poultry in their diet. Um, women did better if they had more leafy greens in their diet. Um, the one thing that came to the top in terms of food groups in this paper was that everyone did better if they had leafy greens in their diet. It was universally the best thing they could do is, is increase leafy greens. Okay, so this is the brain health pyramid that I put together for my book. And like Katrina was asking, you know, what is my book about? Well, when I started writing it, like around 2017, I thought I was writing a manual 
for eating from the MIND diet because that is still the most successful diet to show how we age, right? The MIND diet is still puts up the best numbers of all of them, um, even the Mediterranean diet. Um, but since then, you know, we have so much data about the importance of eating more whole food plant-based. You know, a plant-based diet has many, many advantages. And there are ongoing studies looking at whole food plant-based diets reducing dementia. I can't share them with you yet because they're not ready, um, but there's a couple coming out in the next couple years. But you know, the data is building, kind of see where things are going with this sometimes. Um, so I changed mine a little bit. Um, number one, the MIND and Mediterranean diets, they both recommend a cup of vegetables a day. That's one cup per hour, half cup cooked. <laughs> And I honestly don't think, if you want to get all those flavonoids that I showed you, you want to get a wide variety. We're, I haven't even talked to you about gut diversity yet, but you want to get a wide variety of different plant foods for your gut. I don't, I don't think you can do it with one cup a day. So I upped it to three cups, which is only one and a half cups cooked. It's really not that many vegetables, right? Yeah, I think that's doable. I also added mushrooms as an honorary vegetable. Because since 2015, since the Mind Diet came out, they didn't talk about mushrooms at all. Um, we have several large observational studies from Japan, from Singapore, from Northern Italy, showing that healthy elderly people who eat mushrooms twice a week, a half cup cooked, um, they have up to 50% less dementia than people that don't, all other things being equal. So mushrooms are really good for you. Um, they contain ergothionine and glutathione. All different mushrooms qualify. I also wanted to include cruciferous vegetables. Um, I, I really believe that a third of our vegetable intake should be cruciferous because sulforaphane is an antioxidant in broccoli and bok choy and cauliflower and cabbages um, that is really good, not just for brain health, but for so many things, like anti-cancer. So I want, I want you all to get all the vegetables. That's why I increase them. Whoops. Um, leafy greens, the MIND diet says, eat one cup of leafy greens raw or half cup cooked most days. And the Mediterranean diet says something similar. So I just upped that to two cups. If you're gonna have a salad, have a salad. It's like, what's, what's one cup of leafy greens? It's like, it's like nothing, right? Like this morning I was making eggs, I put two handfuls of spinach in my eggs. It's that easy, instead of one. Um, Cause that is again, like one of the biggest no brainers that you could do. Whole grains, this is the same. Three small servings a day of whole grains. It was recommended in all of these brain protective dietary patterns. Three small servings a day. Berries, the mind diet says twice a week. It's based on Alzheimer's reduction data. I increase mine to daily because that's what the cognitive function data says. These are studies done in women over the age of 60, how they perform on cognitive tests. Well, the women that ate berries every day, they actually did better than ones who only did it twice a week. So I figured that's easy, because who doesn't like berries? You just have to think of berries, have them in the freezer and the, when they're out of season, think about them. Think about how am I gonna eat my berries today? Really, really important food group. Nuts and seeds, I added seeds because seeds are delicious, fun to cook with, and they have all of the same nutrients as nuts, the same monounsaturated fat profile. So I added seeds, plus a lot of people are not allergic, so I use a lot of seeds in my cooking. Yes? Are all nuts equal? No, no. Mm -hmm. So just like I have a, a pyramid, I went a little crazy on pyramids when I was writing the book. <laughs> I was telling someone that I was like, all last summer I was dreaming in food pyramids. It's like a new language. So I have a pyramid for each food group in the book. So there's a nut and seed pyramid, and the most nutrient dense ones are at the bottom. Same for fish and seafood, same for vegetables. So like my vision of the world, like let's eat from the bottom of the pyramid and work our way up. Yeah, so walnuts, for example, would be an, an example of a nut that would be at the bottom of the pyramid. You have amounts, that's the important part. Mm -hmm. There's dose. Yeah, there's a dose when it comes to brain protection that has been studied. All these studies um, are very specific with dose. Yeah, so I have that as well. So with nuts, for example, it's um, four to five quarter cup servings a week. Yeah, so that would be like two tablespoons of almond butter or a small handful of almonds. That right? is so helpful because people say it like this. Right. But I'm German. In Germany, I mean, we <coughs> don't see that very much. So if someone tells me, okay, eat five walnuts a yeah. day, then that. Oh, no, no, no. I, I've been doing this long enough. People need help. They want to know what, exactly, like, what's, what's the dose that will help me? <laughs> um, fish and seafood. Um, Mind Diet says one serving a week is at plenty to protect your brain from Alzheimer's. Um, because fish and seafood contains DHA and EPA, two very essential omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I'm fine with that. I think if you want to eat more fish and seafood, fine. If you don't eat any animal products at all, just eliminate that food group and take a supplement instead. 
Okay, but fish and seafood is a very important food group. I added fermented foods. Uh, it's not talked about in any of these studies. I added it based on a study that came out of Stanford a couple years ago, looking at how important it is for fermented foods and fiber-rich foods for our gut microbiome. And basically everything we're learning about brain health is because of what's happening in the gut. You know, that's a whole other talk. Yes? I just wanted, do you only do organic of all your... No, no, I pick and choose. I, I usually, you know, the whole organic thing, it's like, it's, it's more important that you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and a lot of foods on this pyramid. Um, the organic thing, of course, pesticides um, are bad for the brain because you know, they cause oxidative stress, they cause inflammation. You certainly don't want to consume pesticides more than you have to, but some things are more porous than others. Like potatoes, for example, are very porous. I always get those organic. My leafy greens, I always get organic. My berries, I always get organic. Mm -hmm. Things that I'm gonna peel, like a banana, maybe not, I don't know. Um, there's other factors involved too, like uh, welfare of the people you know, growing it and picking it, things like that. Um, but no, it doesn't always have to be 100% organic. But if you can, go for it. If you, know, if, if you don't mind how much your grocery bill is and it's available to you. But you know, you, this food has to be accessible to everyone. And if you tell someone in a limited budget that they have to buy all of these foods organic at the grocery store, it's, it's, it's not attainable. It's not attainable. Um, and next we have eggs, dairy, and meat which I have a whole chapter for eggs, dairy, and meat in my books, chicken recipes. Um, it's really important that you cook these foods uh, with brain-friendly cooking techniques, which I go into a lot. And if you, don't, if you don't eat any of these animal products, you just take that whole thing off. You, don't, you do not need to eat eggs, dairy, and meat to have a healthy brain. Eliminate that food group and your brain will still thrive. But you can consume it if you like them. Um, in the context of a mostly plant-based diet, there is room for small quantities of high quality animal products, if you like. And I, I, you know, I dialed these back compared to the Mind Diet. The Mind Diet says no more than four servings of red meat a week. Um, I went with no more than four servings of animal products in a week. So I'm including meat and chicken. Okay. And of course, um, with dairy products, I use a lot of nut-based cheeses, nut-based creams and milks, because um, I'm always trying to get rid of the dairy products in the food. And on the very top is sweets, because we, ha we have to have sweets have to enjoy our food. Um, extra virgin olive oil is the primary cooking oil. Water, coffee, and tea is what we should mostly be drinking. Okay, I'm gonna save questions to the end if that's okay, because otherwise some people might need to leave. Okay, so what about drinking? I, I gave, um, I saw that slide in New York a couple weeks ago at the JCC in Manhattan, and this beautiful French woman raises her hand. She's like, I don't see any red wine on your pyramid. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. Um, you know, I was telling you how we're getting all these big studies coming out. Last summer, the UK Biobank study came out. It's over 200,000 participants looking at brain MRIs. Over 200,000, that's a big study. And we're mining it for all this data. Like, what makes the brain shrink more? Someone who eats a lot of processed meat or someone who doesn't? Um, someone who eats a lot of dairy products or doesn't? What about coffee, what about tea? Like, all of these things are being looked at, right? And you can probably guess some of these results. But some of the most interesting findings are coming from alcohol. Moderate drinking, which has been defined by the CDC, is one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men. And a drink is five ounces of wine or some sort of something similar. Um, this is what we consider moderate drinking, right? And moderate drinking has had, you know, in the Mediterranean diet it's recommended. Dr. Martha Clara Morris even included in her pyramid, in her mind diet guidelines. And there's always been some studies that show that, well, maybe it's good for your brain because red wine has resveratrol. It's, it's flavonoids, right? You're just drinking flavonoids. And we all love to think that. It's just the story that we tell ourselves. Um, the actual data is, is a little bit more sobering, honestly. Um, you know, we're seeing lots of brain volume data showing that moderate drinking actually shrinks your brain faster. So I'm very sorry to tell you that if you love red wine as much as I do. Um, this is the study that came out of the UK Biobank. And, you know, my, my book was going to print at the end of last summer. I was turning in my final, final manuscript, and I still had red wine as part of my pyramid. You know, the art was done, everything was done. And I saw the study, and I was like, oh, my gosh. The cutoff in the study is four drinks a week, okay? Not seven or 14, four. And so I called my editor and I said, you know, I really want to rewrite the whole alcohol section because this data is just really compelling and I'm just changing the way I drink. It's changed the way all my friends drink. We're all doing different things now. And um, so we did, we changed it. 
and I took red wine from the food pyramid and I put it in my, you know, that list of five things to limit or avoid. In my book, there's six. So I apologize if this is news for all of you. Um, you know, we're, my husband's a, a wine collector. You know, we have, a, we have an old world cellar. We have a new world cellar. We have one, I, I don't know what it is, it's just weird wines and you, know, you get the picture. So we've changed a lot the way we consume wine. So my, my, my advice on alcohol in 2023 is don't drink. If you don't drink, don't start. We used to think that people that didn't drink were losing out on some sort of protective benefit from wine. It's really not true. If you just look at the resveratrol, you literally have to drink two, like two cases of wine a day to get a medicinal dose of resveratrol. It's a really nice story we tell ourselves, like chocolate, but you know, sometimes we have to look at the facts. So I like to say, don't be a moderate drinker, be a light drinker. And I have a lot of um, mocktails and alternatives in the book. Zero to four drinks is sort of where I'm at right now. In my book, I say under seven, just softens the blow a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't know, for whatever reason. OK. Um, do you all have time to go into women's health for a little bit? It's five after. OK, OK, great. Um, so you all probably know that women get more Alzheimer's than men, right? About a on on matter of like twofold, twofold. Um, Two-thirds of people living with Alzheimer's are female. And this is compounded by the fact that 60% of the caregivers of, of dementia patients are female as well. So women are highly impacted by this disease. So when I told you your risk at 65 was, you know, one in nine, it's actually one in six if you're a woman. It's higher than your, than your risk of getting breast cancer in most of the stages of your life. Uh, and what are some of the reasons why? Well, until a few years ago, no one was really very interested in this topic which is not surprising, right, if you followed women's health and research for a while. Maria Shriver was actually the first person to ask the question, why are women getting so much more Alzheimer's than men? And all the answers were, people would say, well, women live longer than men. And she said, I'm not buying it. The, age, the, the lifespan for men and women is closing because of advances in cancer treatments and cardiovascular. Men used to like really you know, succumb to cardiovascular diseases at midlife much more commonly than they do now. Um, so men are doing better, men are healthier, men are getting to older ages more, with more cardiovascular health, and that age gap is only a couple years. So this is, this is not, no longer a valid answer. Here are some of the things that science has, has been looking into. Number one, women have less education than men. This is a known factor. The Lancet Commission out of the UK has a list of 12 modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. The first one is lack of early childhood education accounts for probably 2% of the global burden of Alzheimer's in the world. So remember we talked about cognitive reserve? You know, maybe some of us are fortunate enough to have gone through schooling and gotten great educations and everything, but of course it's not like that in most places, and especially for girls. And if you don't become like a student, like a lifelong student, lifelong learner, maybe that is something that will increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Nobody really knows, honestly, what this education piece is, but it's, it's really compelling. Loss of estrogen at menopause makes the brain vulnerable. What do you think of that? It's true. Yeah, there's something called the estrogen hypothesis. Again, Dr. Lisa Moscone, Dr. Roberta Britton, who Jeannie's had come speak with you all. Um, they have been working on this for many, many years. The estrogen hypothesis is basically starting to say that no estrogen is a neuroprotective hormone for your brain. The more estrogen you have been exposed to in your life, the lower your risk of Alzheimer's. That means if you went through puberty early and then you went through menopause late, you've had lots of estrogen exposure from your body naturally, your risk is lower, okay? If you went through puberty late and Alzheimer's early, your risk is higher. If you took birth control pills for 30 years, your risk is less for Alzheimer's disease. If you also took HRT, your risk is less. And more and more we're seeing whether it's natural hormones whether it's hormones that you take for birth control or for hormone replacement, at the more estrogen that you have, the better your brain does over time. And we're seeing large-scale studies like the one in Cache County, Utah, with reductions of something like 40 to 50% in dementia rates over 10, 12, 15 years. These studies are starting to get longer and longer. So that's really good news. It's really good news for, you know, especially if you're worried about having been on the birth control pill, like a lot of my patients always were. Um, another one, women get less sleep. We know there's a relation between Alzheimer's disease and sleeplessness. Um, insomnia is kind of a soft risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. People that have Alzheimer's don't sleep well. Is it the chicken or the egg? 
Um, women go through periods of time in their life where they just don't sleep well, right? Puberty, adolescence, postpartum for sure, sometimes pregnancy. Oh, and then there's that seven and a half years of perimenopause. <laughs> You know, so, um, and men, you know, men get up with babies now too, right? Like modern dads are great. But women are spe specifically the ones that are, you know, probably not getting the sleep. Diagnosis is delayed. This is very true. Women test differently on these cognitive tests than men. Yeah, my mom, you know, she actually breathed through three years of cognitive tests before um, she was actually diagnosed. Yeah, she tested really well. Women are more verbally gifted than men. We know this. It's not just, it's not just a thing. It's like it's been tested. Men have better, different skills than women. Women have more verbal skills. So a lot of these tests test your verbal skills. You know, like here's 20 names of animals. How many can you remember in five minutes? You know, it's a verbal skill. Um, alcohol may be more neuro neurotoxic in women. This we know for sure. Women have less of the enzyme that degrades alcohol. That's why you can't match, you know, your male partner drink for drink. You just simply can't physiologically um, unless they have some sort of predisposition to not metabolizing alcohol like some Asian Americans do. Um, the APOE gene, vari APOE4 gene variant is expressed differently in men. Do we all know what APOE4 is? APOE4 is a risk gene for late onset Alzheimer's. We're not talking about early Alzheimer's like in the movie Still Alice. That's an autosomal dominant gene. You get that gene and you get Alzheimer's. Like, pfft, it's called deterministic genes. It's like sickle cell anemia. You get the gene for sickle cell anemia, you get sickle cell anemia. This is not what we're talking about. These are risk genes. They're modifiable. They're, they can be modified based on nutrition, exercise, stress mitigation, sleep, lifestyle habits. Can turn these, turn these genes down or just turn down the volume of them. So APOE4 is really common. One in 25 Americans have one or two copies of APOE4. But if you have two copies, your risk is greatly increased, about 15-fold. And if you have one copy, your risk is increased about three to five-fold. So it's, it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's for sure. Now women with one copy of APOE4 is like a man with two, okay? It accelerates the path to Alzheimer's five years faster than in men. So there's something with women in this gene that is particularly um, dangerous. So it's just a good thing to know. There's a lot of work being done on that. Okay, we're starting to see studies finally on does HRT, hormone replacement therapy at menopause, help your brain or not, right? This has been a really muddy area of research. I've been following it since the 80s, um, since I was in medical school. Um, I'm following all of the studies, including the WHI. And what we're finding now, women, one piece of the puzzle, women who carry the APOE4, when they go through menopause, their brains are vulnerable. They're starting, you know, that continuum of when you get tau and amyloid building up in the preclinical stages, they're really vulnerable to this. You know, they're getting tau deposition. The earlier the menopause, the worse it is. But HRT is helping. Like if these women actually have access to HRT and they take it, their brain volume data looks better. So this is revolutionary. This is brand new. It just came out this year. Um, it's a really, really important study, and hopefully many others will follow. This just came out, well, last week, a couple weeks ago. Um, the age of menopause and when you start your hormone therapy, how much tau do you get deposited? Um, and amyloid, remember I told you tau is like more important in women? Tau seems to get deposited more preferentially in perimenopause for women. So this was an interesting study. They actually compared men and women. They're doing PET scans, looking at amyloid and tau, which is one way to do it. And so the men are being compared to the women, okay? The women are going through menopause. Of course, the men are not. Um, and they're all going through the stage of midlife. And what they showed was the earlier women went through menopause, the more amyloid and tau they got, they, was built up. Okay. Wasn't happening in men. So we know that menopause triggers changes in the brain. It triggers less glucose metabolism. It triggers um, chronic inflammation. That's the brain fog um, that impairs memory and word retrieval and things like that. Like we know this is happening. It's triggered by hormonal changes going up and down. We know all this is happening. We know that hormone therapy helps. Not everyone can take hormones, obviously. It's a very individual thing. But women at least need to know, you know what the choices are before they say they don't want to take it. And the problem right now is like a lot of women even aren't even being offered. So I have a newsletter 
I'm going to give you all a month's access to my newsletter so you can read through some articles if they interest you. This is the one that I wrote a couple months ago about how do you talk to your doctor about hormone therapy. Because there seems to be a problem nowadays where a lot of gynecologists um, may not be well versed in it unless they're of a certain age. <laughs> you know, like I grew up prescribing hormone therapy, like my same age colleagues. But younger doctors may not know that unless they're super interested in it. And I also have in here the link to the North American Menopause Society statement on hormone therapy, who should take it, who shouldn't, what should be cautious about it, things like that. Something you can take to your doctor and say, like, well, I read this. What do you think? You know, my candidate. Sometimes doctors need to be educated as well. Okay, there's a question. It doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer during menopause? So estrogen does not increase breast cancer risk. And once you have breast cancer? People who have had breast cancer is a completely different ballgame. Yeah, if you've had breast cancer, as you know, some of you probably have, you will do anything to reduce recurrence, and including not taking exogenous hormones, depend, especially depending on the tumor type. Some, some breast cancer cells respond to estrogen, some do not. But we avoid it in everyone to be, to be safe. Yes? Can, can you just elaborate in a few sentences on the, because it seems like a challenge to current dogma, estrogen does not increase breast cancer risk because that's not what I've, I'm used to hearing? And yeah, what's really exciting now is that there's a lot of interest in going back over some of these old papers, like the Women's Health Initiative that came out in 2002, and looking at the flaws in these studies. And for example, the Women's Health Initiative came out, it was supposed to be a study looking at, is hormone therapy safe for women, right? And it was stopped abruptly because they made a decision to have a press release and say that, you know, the hormones are so dangerous, we had a bunch of heart attacks and strokes, that we're gonna say that we're gonna stop the study, okay? And we all know, it's, it's been known for a very long time, that if you take hormones early in menopause, the risks are very low. If you wait five, 10 years, and then you take hormone therapy, the risks are higher, because you could have developed some heart disease, right? And we all know hormones can cause blood clots sometimes. So women in the, w, in the WHI were over 60 years old, okay? You couldn't get into the WHI if you had menopausal symptoms. You couldn't get into the WHI if you're under 60. This is our seminal study that we, all of this has, knowledge has come from. 70% um, were obese, 50% were smokers. So this is a population study of people that when they started HRT in their 60s, having never been on it before, they got a few cases of heart attacks and strokes and the researchers stopped the study. Um, they did not have an increased risk of breast cancer in the estrogen only arm they had a not statistically significant increase in breast cancer in the estrogen plus medroxyprogesterone acetate arm. And the MPA we know is thrombogenic, it causes blood clots, and I, I believe it's not prescribed anymore. Um, the estrogen only people, no increased risk of breast cancer. So even a lot of the studies, when you look back on them, are highly flawed. And it scared patients. I lived through this, I was, I was a menopause doctor when all this happened. Um, it scared patients, it scared doctors. Doctors who didn't really have the um, institutional knowledge of how all this went down were just like, well, I'm not gonna prescribe hormones. That's like liability. And women were afraid, because women don't wanna do anything to increase their breast cancer risk. Um, but we know from, st from many, many studies, as taking estrogen doesn't give you breast cancer, okay? Breast cancer, kind of like Alzheimer's, takes a long time to develop. You know, it takes a really long time to go from a single cell to something that shows up in your mammogram, years. So if you throw estrogen in the mix, while that breast cancer is an evolution, and that is an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it will make it grow faster, but it doesn't increase metastases. So it doesn't change cure rates, and it doesn't change mortality rate. So causality is a different thing. Causality is, is the um, thing that's being challenged. And that's, that's where a lot of the experts, even oncologists now are coming out on. Yeah, I know it's different. It's, the, the, everything's changing, yes. Outside of the US, how is HRT approached? Like in the UK or other developed countries? Completely different. You can buy it from your pharmacist. You know, you go to, I can go to Italy and I can get HRT. I, I actually buy my HRT in Italy because it's a fraction of the price. But you don't need a doctor's prescription. Um, they have always had more bioidentical forms and offered less of the like um, 
you know, the pharmaceutical ones. So they're more, they have a long history of bioidentical hormones. Bioidentical not meaning that you have to go to a pharmacist and they compound it for you, which I'm not always a super fan of, um, but it's just natural estradiol. The one that, you know, our body makes as opposed to like an animal product. Yeah, but we don't have like super great data. We have some good data on HRT and dementia in Europe, but the long-term study is really hard to come by. Yeah, Jeannie? How long, if you start HRT, would you say patients should be taking it? Um, it's person by person. You know, there used to be a cutoff of five years. That's no longer true. Um, the North American Menopause Society used to say, this was like 20 years ago, take the smallest dose for the shortest amount of time. Um, we know that's not really good advice now because, number one, the smallest dose may not be therapeutic. There's a therapeutic dose of estrogen that will protect your bones from hip fracture. There's a therapeutic dose of estrogen that will protect your brain from dementia. Um, there's a therapeutic dose that protects you from heart disease and diabetes. All of these things are known facts. Um, if you're taking like a homeopathic dose, you're not going to get the benefits, number one. Um, and then the length of time, that really depends on your, you know, if you're someone who's really healthy and you exercise, you don't have a family history of heart disease, you don't have a family history of breast cancer, you've never had breast cancer, your cholesterol is great, your doctor loves you, they're like, oh, you're fine, nothing wrong with you. Um, this is someone who could probably continue if you're continuing to get benefits from it. And what we're finding, the research is longer continuation, that Cache County study out of Utah is 10 plus years, lower dementia rates. And then we have all this science background research like estrogen's neuroprotective, early menopause increases risk, you get less tau and amyloid deposition, you know, if you go through later menopause, and if you take HRT. So, so all of these things are like pieces in the puzzle that is, is being worked out. Yes? What are newer studies saying about the cardiac risk with HRT? It's very, very difficult to say. If you talk to a cardiologist, they're going to be like, eh, I don't really want you to take it more than 10 years. In your 60s, I'm not a fan of it. Um, if you go to a gynecologist who's, who's well-versed and been following this, they're going to follow you year by year. They might ask to do, at some point, like a calcium scoring of your chest. So if you have any calcium deposits in your coronary arteries, that's a, that's a smart thing to do. Um, maybe you get an echo at some point. Maybe do some cardiovascular testing to make everyone feel better that, yeah, you don't have cardiovascular disease. Just because you're 62 doesn't mean you have cardiovascular disease. Yeah. I just did a cardiac CT scan oh, yeah. at Stanford. Oh, yay. Yeah. You have to pay for it yourself. It's $150, but it's really easy. That's it? That's a, that's a really good deal. In the back. Um, how soon after menopause do you need to start the hormone? Well, the earlier the better is what all the data is saying. Early, good, bad, late. Um, you get most of the benefits and the least amount of side effects and complications if you start early. Um, the later you start, the worse. But the question now is like so many women are suffering through menopause and their brains are really suffering. And I'm not really worried about their brains because of this data, right? Um, so what if you're five years out? It's tough. Um, I think it's an individualized thing. What if you're 10 years out? A little more uncomfortable as a doctor starting. Um, it has to be individualized. Yeah, yes? Is there any role for progesterone? Um, progesterone in the brain um, has some, some bioactive activities in the brain, but not in terms of prevention. We know progesterone, different, there's like, progesterone's a family of hormones, of which there's dozens. Um, and we know that the type that was in the WHI is more thrombogenic, cause more blood clots. There's another type of progesterone that actually was studied years ago to prevent breast cancer. Um, women couldn't tolerate it because it makes you nauseated. So progesterone is this huge family. They all have these different actions depending on which ones you take. But right. You, sh you yeah. shouldn't take estrogen without progesterone if you have a uterus. Right. If you have a uterus, you need to take progesterone to balance the estrogen. Yeah. Yes. Hi, um, I'm 60, so I feel like I missed the boat. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. It was, it was not recommended. But anyway, are there any good sources of hormones, estrogen? Well, there's a class of flavonoids yeah. called isoflavones. They've been extensively studied in terms of both treating menopausal symptoms and maybe preventing Alzheimer's disease later. My personal experience as a menopause doctor um, was that I never really saw it to be very helpful. And I had women try really hard, like they're eating so much tofu and <laughs> so, much, so much edamame. Um, I haven't found that to be helpful, unfortunately, but it should be studied more. Would you completely rule, I know it's individual, but somebody who's 60 and has um, symptoms not starting? 
I would, go, I would find a gynecologist who is well-versed in these things. And if she wants you to see a cardiologist or someone to get screening, you're like, sure, I'll get screened. I'll go get a CT. It's only $150. Yeah. And you, look at that article that I wrote, how to talk to your doctor about hormone therapy. Print off the NAMS um, statement. It's all laid out there. You know, some doctors may not be aware of the gui current guidelines. They change every year. Um, and make a case for yourself. You know, I am, I'm, I am symptomatic. Um, I'm worried about my brain. And I, if I'm a candidate for hormone therapy, I would like to know. Like everything else, like osteoporosis. Yeah. However, yeah, there's all these benefits. Um, however, you can age with a healthy brain without hormone therapy. The, the whole thing with hormone therapy is, you know, women didn't really do much after menopause 100 years ago. That was kind of like end of life. You, you know, you have your children, and then you go through menopause, and you're no longer reproductive activity, and then, you know, the, there wasn't this huge lifespan that we have of 30, 40 years after the menopausal years. So modern times require modern approaches. Um, people say estrogen's not natural. I'm like, yeah, well, women used to, you know, we're like old at age, you know, 60 before. Now 60's really young. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it. Yes? Can you measure the estrogen in the blood and see uh -huh. if it's still high, even though you are? Yeah, but estrogen's not a great way to measure. There's a hormone that is reflective of estrogen. Estrogen goes like this. FSH levels go like this. So if you're trying to diagnose menopause, you look at FSH with an estradiol level, but not just estrogen by itself. Okay, a couple more. Hi. Um, for, so I've been on these, these kind of diets for a really long time, the Mediterranean, really healthy diets, um, but also have an inflammatory disease and hardly, you know, early menopause, no estrogen. Am I still being someone like me who has these risk factors? Are we still being benefited by the diet as, as well as somebody who doesn't? Um, it, I, I guess it would be an individual question. This is an anti-inflammatory diet, by all means. Um, it's helpful for all chronic illnesses. You know, I talk about brain health. That's what people um, really seem to latch onto, like they want to have a healthy brain. But, you know, these diets protect you from diabetes. They protect you from, you know, heart disease, osteoarthritis, um, autoimmune diseases, certainly. So I think that they're, they're supportive of health in many, many ways. Um, whatever you have going on might be different. Some people need to eliminate certain things based on that. And then yeah, it's always tricky to get it. Other issues, some of these negative issues that you talked about are problematic issues. Would they still be, are they at like, are we doomed in terms of the brain health if we're still eating this kind of diet? No, I think you look at the neuroprotective foods, you look at the data, you look at what you can eat. You can only do what you can do. And you make sure, like, if you can eat berries, you're like, dang, I'm gonna eat berries every day. Like, I'm not gonna miss a berry day. Um, if you can eat leafy greens, I mean, those two things reduce your risk significantly of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so do the things that you know you can do. Yes? Um, when you said talk to your doctor about hormone therapy, is that just an OBGYN or would a primary care doctor be a candidate for that? You could talk to your primary care doctor. It's, an OBGYN is going to be more well versed in the studies. In, Say that again? An OBGYN doctor is more well versed and trained in these studies, but they're great FPs. I had, I had a, in my partnership, I had an FP, and she was great. So, but like in case one says no, you can go to the other sort of thing? Definitely. <laughs> if mom says no, ask dad. <laughs> okay, I wanted to give you guys a couple of tips and tricks before we go. Um, how do you do this in your own kitchen, right? It's not like dairy is bad, but it can be a big source of saturated fat. It doesn't have the type of brain health nutrients we're talking about. So I've pretty much replaced dairy with plant-based milk in my kitchen. I like to make it from scratch because most, a lot of the stuff that you buy is really ultra-processed. But you can get good products. Just read the label. It should just have like almonds, salt, and water, right? Um, avoid the ones that have any gums in them because we're finding that those are disruptive to the microbiome, like carrageenan and things like that. Um, you have to shake it. It's not going to be as attractive, but those are the best plant milks to buy. Um, I use cashew cream as a staple in my kitchen. It's the first thing I show everyone when they come to a cooking class. You soak cashews, you add a small amount of water, you put it in a blender. It turns into something that looks like whipped cream. You can take it sweet, you can take it savory. When I take it savory, I might add like basil and garlic. And my husband loves mayonnaise, you know, so I'm like always trying to get him off mayonnaise. And so he can slather that on a sandwich. You can toss it with vegetables. It's, it's just like a, a creamy, you know, dairy-like sauce. And then if you go sweet, you put a little bit of honey or maple syrup or a date and a little bit, maybe a little bit of vanilla. 
It can be a dessert topping. Um, lots and lots of things you can do with that. Um, cheese, I have some recipes in the book for really easy nut-based cheeses. I have a cashew ricotta. Um, you know, these are just things you can make at home in 10 minutes in your food processor. Um, I'm not really fond of the nut-based cheeses I see at the grocery store. Look at the ingredient label. You know, you're probably better off eating like really good cheese, <laughs> honestly. But, um, you know, the cheese is restricted in the brain healthy diet. It truly is. It's one of the things that people have the hardest time with. Coffee, I'm not a fan of putting all sorts of stuff in your coffee. Coffee has performed very well in all of these studies, okay? It's performed very well. Coffee contains hundreds of different antioxidants. But when we add dairy to it, we add sugar to it, we add artificial sweeteners, all of those things, it actually turns it into an ultra-processed food. Um, so try to drink your coffee black if you can, or at least get rid of the sugar component, get rid of the artificial creamers. If you can't go off cream entirely, try some really nice plant milk. I have a recipe for coffee creamer in my book that I developed for my husband. He likes it just as much as half and half. It's really good. Um, extra virgin olive oil is the primary thing that I cook with. I used to buy so much butter. We used to have butter on the counter all the time in one of those crocks so you can spread it anytime you want on toast. And um, we all loved butter. Around the holidays, I used to buy pounds and pounds of butter to make traditional cookies. Like, I never buy butter anymore. Even ghee? No, ghee has the same sa the saturated fat profile. It just doesn't have the solid, so the smoke point's higher. Um, so it's a, it's a paradigm shift in your kitchen, your cooking, and your thinking. Butter's delicious. I use butter for high flavor. Like, there's an anchovy butter in the book that I use to put on chicken or fish. It's really delicious. Um, as an avocado butter. So I'm stretching the butter by mashing avocado into it. So I do, I do some fun things with butter. Of, um, olive oil. You know, when I, I have, you know, I gotta do roasted potatoes for my Yeah, so if you wanna use olive oil over 375, use something with a higher smoke point, like avocado oil or pecan oil. Or you can mix them, yeah. Um, I use whole grain flours instead of all-purpose white. There's no more all-purpose white in my kitchen. Um, I use, if I have to make like a birthday cake for a kid or something, I'll use um, einkorn wheat flour, which has a lot more fiber in it. Jovial is a really good brand. But I mostly, you know, gluten is not a thing of interest for Alzheimer's prevention, really. Um, but the gluten-free flours are something I really embrace because they're more nutrient-dense. Almond flour, hazelnut flour, you know, buckwheat, chick, you know, chickpea flour. All these gluten-free flours are really good things to have in the kitchen. So I give you some ideas how to cook with them. Instead of using refined sugar, I use dates, fruit parades, honey, maple syrup. It's not that these things aren't sugar. We're not kidding ourselves that these aren't sugar, okay? But we're, they also have other attributes, like selenium, magnesium, fiber, you know, things like that. They're whole foods. Um, if you consume meat or chicken, I would challenge you to buy the highest quality meats you can find in small portions, preferably from people that raise them um, in very small areas. Yeah, and opting out of industrial meat, the industrial meat production, we're completely opting out. Chicken, meat, pork, all of that. You can comp where you guys live, or you're so lucky, you can completely opt out of that and buy from small farms. Um, and a good rule of thumb is that three quarters of your plate should be plants, which Jeannie has been saying, telling us for ages. Yes? So you said for bread and meat, three ounces, four times a week? That's the Mind Diet guidelines. Okay. I say no more than four servings total, meat or chicken, in a week. In a week, okay, and then three ounces each? Yeah. So is there a difference if, for example, um, you have a six ounce steak and you're like, well, those are two of my servings, but I'm having it <coughs> in one sitting? <laughs> <laughs> like a three ounce steak is hard to find, but I can find a six ounce steak. And when I'm having, you know, I have a four year old and a seven year old, and my bad day is made so much better with that little bit of ribeye. So I don't know if that is negligible or, or no, you really want it separate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, it does, it's not about perfection. Okay. If your diet is truly mostly plant-based, yes. having little ribeye is not going to change your cholesterol that much. It's not going to change your overall health, whether or not you're going to get Alzheimer's. It's just really not that big of a deal if your whole diet is really plant-based. Okay. If that steak is like the thing on your plate that you're just like, all I have time to do is eat this steak, and you do that a lot, it's the things you do most of the time that matter with your long-term health. Um, but those studies, you know, the studies we have on meat need to be updated. A lot of the studies come from processed meats. or all meats being lumped into one category, much of them being processed meats? So now I'm starting to see studies of like grass-fed meat, like I get in Wyoming, like my friends who are ranchers grow, um, bison, grass-fed beef, and a diet that has a small amount of grass-fed beef, maybe it's six ounces, okay? okay. In a primarily plant-based diet where three-quarters of your plate is plants, 
um, they found no changes in their cardiovascular risk factors. Okay. So we're starting to see small studies like this. So you can be smart about it. You can be smart about it. Yes? Can you clarify something you said about gluten? Because I, I find that people are afraid of a good piece of bread. And so I think I understood you to say that gluten flours are more nutrient dense or gluten-free flowers mm -hmm. are more nutrient-dense. They can we, be. But do we need to be afraid of gluten? If no. If we don't have celiac disease or we're not gluten-sensitive, it's only 5% of the world's population. Right. We do not need to be afraid of gluten because of brain health. There is, there is a whole body of mythology that grew out of this over the last couple of decades. Hopefully it's coming to the end based on a book called Brain Grain and Wheat Belly. Mm -hmm. Th these were based on anecdotal studies, um, not, not really the kind of science that you know, I hang my hat on and like to share. Um, but it, it really scared people, kind of like the whole hormone thing. It just scared people. And so we had, at one point in the US, we had something like 40% of the population was gluten-free, even though they didn't have celiac, an allergy, or a sensitivity. Because so, gluten-3 was thought to be healthy. But then there are gluten-free gummy bears. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to do a quick recap and then I'm going to let you guys go and we'll have time for questions if you can hang around. Okay. For example, this is, um, this is a really nutrient dense wheat. This is farro. This is the carrot farrodo. It's like a risotto I make with farro or a wheat berry. Um, so, you know, even gluten full foods are like really good. Um, okay, quick life, quick recap. Lifestyle factors may help you fend off Alzheimer's. There's that whole field of epigenetics. Epigenetics is how you modify your genes. Um, a people with ApoE4, and then there's genes we probably haven't even discovered yet. There's dozens and dozens of genes that are implicated with Alzheimer's, not just a couple. There's dozens of them, and they're discovering more every month. Um, but lifestyle factors turn them down. We know this. There's, there's a way they do it. It's called epigenetics. It's a methylation. It's a chemical reaction. It's really cool. Like going to yoga or meditating actually turns down the volume of these genes. This we know. This is not, no longer woo-woo. This is a fact. This is science. I can give you a whole talk on that. Um, I want you to avoid sugary and artificially sweet drinks, period. Artificially sweet drinks are no better or worse than sugary drinks. They're all super bad, okay? Especially for your gut microbiome. And your brain. Enjoy your coffee and tea black if possible. I would like to challenge you to get rid of any sugar or artificial sweeteners in your coffee or your tea and really start to enjoy the flavors of the coffee and you know, that's, it's a true brain healthy beverage and let's keep it that way. Um, the Mediterranean and the mind diets are brain protective. In 2023, these, this is the best science we have that shows how to eat to protect your brain. Okay? Um, like I shared with you, my, my pyramid is kind of a, a more plant-based mind and Mediterranean dietary pattern. And you know, I, I could be standing up here in two years saying, we all really need to be whole food plant-based because I'm waiting for those studies to come out. But in 2023, this is the best way to eat to protect your brain. Flavonoids are crucial for brain health nutrients. This is my dog, Olive Oil. Oh. <laughs> she's, she's a reminder to you. <laughs> we call her Livy. Um, to use extra virgin olive oil as your primary cooking oil. I have a whole chapter about olive oil in the book, about how to buy it, why freshness matters, how to read a label, how to cook with it, all of these things. Amyloid protein is cleared from the brain when you sleep. I don't think we talked about that. But um, getting high quality sleep is a priority for everyone especially those of us at midlife. Drink light leaf at all. Eat berries, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and leafy greens every day. These are your everyday foods. Okay. Eating for brain health is not a diet. Did you get that from my talk? Yeah. This is not Whole30, right? This is not like you go on in January and all your friends do it and then you go off of it and you go back to what you were doing before. It's a lifestyle, so you really have to figure out how you're going to do it for you. You have to really figure out that fit part. How is this going to fit with you? How are you, are you going to prioritize taking care of your brain? And how are you going to protect it and nourish it? That is, that is the job I put in front of all of you. I have resources for you. Of course, you can buy my book. I would love for you to have it. I also have 100 free recipes on my website. If you want to just dip your toe into Brain Healthy Cooking and see what's over there, there most of them are different from the book. Um, I have a newsletter. I'm going to send you all a link for a free access. You can look at some of those articles. And you can follow along in the newsletter if you want to continue it. And I'll write to you a couple times a week with little reminders and homework and things to do, and recipes. Um, my email is brainhealthkitchen at gmail.com. I do brain health retreats, week-long retreats in Italy and Panama, where we do a deep dive into the Mediterranean diet or um, something else. And we just, we just have the best time. So um, I announce those. 
Um, Sally Duplante over here, who you sort of met. This is Sally. She's an incredible resource for all of you in the Bay Area and everywhere. She has Wellness Wednesdays that are free webinars you can sign up for. Um, I'm going to be joining her on May 24th. Yeah, and I have, a, I have a handout if anybody wants it. So oh, perfect. You can just come get these. Yes. Sally is an amazing person. We're going to be talking about supplements versus food. We didn't get into supplements today. That's a whole, that's like a whole other thing. But I have a lot, I have some opinions on supplements, um, and I'd love to share them with you. Okay. So your homework, are you ready? You have my email. I want you to tell me one thing you will do to make your diet more brain healthy. Just one thing. I don't need long paragraphs. You're welcome to write long paragraphs. <laughs> Writing things down actually is a really good way to make an intention. But I want you to think about crystallizing in on one thing that you will do to make more brain healthy. And this cake that Jeannie made for us in these little tiny um, formats. So this is a good example of some of those swaps I talked about. Um, there's sugar in this cake. Like, a lot of my food is not so austere as some other healthy cooks. I actually use sugar and stuff like that. But this cake is made with olive oil. It's made with nutrient-dense flours, combination of almond and oat flour. Um, it, it's gluten-free for your gluten-free friends, so everyone can enjoy it, which is great. And it uses a whole orange and a whole lemon that you boil until it's really soft, and then you slice them in half, and you scoop out all the goop from the lemon, just keep the rind, and just take the seeds out of the orange. You throw it in a food processor and pulse it until it turns into marmalade. I used to call this marmalade cake. And then you have, like, oranges and lemons have so much fiber, right? And I love using the peel of citrus because the peel is rich in flavonoids. You know, like in Italian cultures, they use lemon peel all the time. They preserve lemons and eat the whole thing. Yeah, so you're eating a whole orange and a whole lemon in this cake. It provides fiber, which slows down the absorption of any sugar from the cake, because there's a little bit of sugar. Um, provides a lot of flavor, it makes it moist. Um, think of all the vitamin C and all the nutrients you're getting from eating a whole orange and a whole lemon. So that's, that's kind of like one of the cooking techniques that um, I share with you. And it, everyone likes it, it's a really kind of a foolproof cake. I've had many, many students mess it up in classes and it's still good. <laughs> it's still good, it's still good. And I think that's all I have for you. I have some references if you're interested. Thank you for your attention. So the question is, I'm 47, I'm pretty sure I'm perimenopausal, <laughs> and I have some memory yeah, issues, yeah, what's yeah, normal and what's not. Yeah. Um, so whenever your hormones are changing during perimenopause, yeah. um, it definitely triggers problems with memory. Um, and that's compounded by disruption in sleep. So one of, the, one of the best ways to cure mild memory problems is to commit yourself to really good sleep hygiene. And I know with hormones, it makes you wake up in the middle of the night. You don't always have control over this. But there's other things you can't control. Like we know alcohol disrupts sleep. Like um, have you ever used a whoop or an aura? Right? And you look at your sleep architecture. How many people have done that? Yeah. So what happens when you drink a glass of wine before bed? What happens to your sleep, your sleep cycles? Yeah, my heart rate stays up much longer, heart rate stays up. so it doesn't dip earlier in the evening. Yeah. And so then you don't get as much rest of heart rate, and you just don't feel as rested when you wake up. As exactly. It's one, one of the things that happens. It's one of the things. And alcohol is, and I'm not saying this is your problem. <laughs> <laughs> alcohol, alcohol is a sedative, right? So you fall asleep. But then three to six hours later, the glutamate in it gets, it's an activator. So three in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, whatever it is for you, 2.30 in the morning, bam. It's, it's what's in the alcohol. So, you know, if you're really strict about, you know, optimizing your sleep, you would be avoiding alcohol within six hours of going to bed. You wouldn't eat three hours before bed. You'd have a bedtime. Um, you do all the things that you can do. And when it, if it was more serious, like you said, it usually starts with you forget uh, where you're going, places like that. Or, I mean, when do you, you need to be concerned if it's just more than normal? When you're concerned, you should go see someone. Yeah. Can I add to that really quickly? Uh -huh. I'm 45 and I've been waking up earlier in the middle of the night. So what I've learned is if I can get out and get direct sunlight in my eyes right before 9 a.m., that actually helps your body produce melatonin at night, which helps you. So I've been doing this consistently and my sleep has got a little better. So if you can maybe mm -hmm. put that in your morning routine. It's such a great point. All, there's all these things you can do for sleep hygiene. Um, getting, going to bed at the, right, at the same time every night and getting up at the same time every morning is 
probably the most important one, getting natural sunlight in your eyeballs first thing. So you go for a walk or like if you like my stretching, my new stretching routine, I'm doing it in a, like a lit place where I'm getting natural sunlight coming in or I take my dogs for a walk if I'm home. You know, that's really, really important. And then be careful what you consume in the evening before. As far as, my opinion is that the brain healthy diet, like the mind diet, is probably the best way to eat as you're going through menopause because it minimizes blood sugar fluctuations. And one of the problems at menopause is your blood sugar is going up and down because your estrogen is going up and down. And you have these um, periods of, it's called a, Dr. Roberta Brinton calls it a bioenergetic crisis when your glucose metabolism just like is in the toilet all of a sudden. Do you ever feel that way in perimenopause? Like you're going about your day and then all of a sudden you feel like, like I could go to bed right now. And your brain is just like slowing down. So that's glucose hypometabolism. And one way to combat that, hopefully, um, if you're not taking estrogen or something else, is with keeping your blood sugar really stable. Now you don't start HRT until you actually hit menopause, is that? No, but some, some doctors use birth control pills to stabilize hormones during the perimenopause. Oh, okay. If the people can date. Yes? My dad has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. What's the likelihood that I'm going to get it? What age did he get it? Um, late 70s? Mm, hard to say. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's probably not a huge factor. It's probably not a huge factor. You worry about it when your parents are diagnosed, you know, somewhat early. Certainly early onset. Early Alzheimer's is a completely different thing than late onset. That's the movie Still Alice. That's the woman who is 50 years old, the MIT professor, and she gets lost. It's like horrible. Um, that's different. But with late onset Alzheimer's disease, it can start presenting in the 60s. And the earlier, early onset of late onset is, can be concerning. That might mean that there's an ApoE4 gene involved especially in women, because I told you it's accelerated. But if your dad had it in his 70s, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say. Okay. Well, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. No. You just do all the things you can do anyways. <laughs> uh, Roberta Brinton, when she was here, she talked about, like, your risk was greater if your mom had it or your grandmother had it mm -hmm. versus the male side. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. For autosolon dominant. For, for early onset. Oh, it's only early I think it's early onset. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I can look it up. I, I might be wrong. Uh, in the back with pigtails. Um, hi, I um, wanted to ask about fat-free yogurt, uh -huh. dairy yogurt, mm -hmm. because it doesn't have the saturated fat. Right. And it would be better than the high-fat Greek yogurt, for example. I like to eat dairy yogurt that's fat-free. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's completely fine. You know, I'm not a huge fan of low-fat dairy products. Because when they take out the fat, all the vitamins go with it. The D, the A, the E, the K, they're all fat-soluble vitamins. So they, you know, they take out all the fat. Um, and it's recommended if you have high cholesterol or, or some other diet, like your doctor will say, you need to be on low-fat dairy. Okay? Um, and that's not a bad thing. But all the vitamins get taken out, and then they fortify it with vitamins, which are maybe not so absorbable now because they're not in their natural forms. They're different forms of the vitamins. So I think if you like your low-fat yogurt, by all means, enjoy it. You know, make sure you're getting your nutrients from other things. I actually consume full-fat Greek yogurt because it's really high in protein. I want the fat in my yogurt because I'm eating with my berries, and it helps me absorb all the flavonoids from the berries. So, um, so I make an exception. Yes? Do you think for early onset, um, these are not beneficial or modifying of the severity of progression, or just that we don't know? So for early Alzheimer's, the type that afflicts people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, it's definitely familial. It's definitely an autosomal dominant gene that um, if one of your parents have it, there's a 50% chance that you will have it. If you have the gene, you get the disease. Mm -hmm. And w we currently don't know if lifestyle interventions help. Okay. There's a lot of studies going on right now, but this is not about that. This is not about that. I know. It's unknown. It's, it's very sad, and we, I don't know where it's, it's going to be going. Yes? I just want to say, I just learned this recently, that alfalfa is now GMO'd. So it's been sprayed with Roundup five times. And any dairy is, those cows are fed alfalfa. So buy organic. That's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely, we buy organic dairy. Absolutely, it's such a good point. You want it, I mean, you understand what I'm saying about organic and, 
having people have access to food, right? If you can't afford food, then don't let organic be a barrier. But if you can afford it, you're going to want to choose organic as much as possible. Yes, in the back. Uh, you, yes. Um, I was just going to ask if you recommend intermittent fasting along with like detox. So the question is intermittent fasting and detoxing. Um, there's a lot of research about intermittent fasting that's very compelling about how it affects brain health. I personally am a fan. I've been doing it for like five years, but I'm like lazy about it. I don't, don't do it very consistently. There's not enough data to say that a practice of fasting is going to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease, but you might get other brain health benefits from it. When you say intermittent fasting, I was wondering, is it like maybe you do one day every week or is it like two days a week? No, the practice of, there's different ways you can do it. The practice of fasting is um, a daily thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some people do, um, they f do big fast for two days out of seven mm -hmm. and eat normal the other five days. Um, the one I'm talking about that has been shown in studies at least to reduce diabetes and improve metabolic health um, is doing a daily practice of intermittent fasting where you just basically eat early in the evening and you have your first meal of the day, like late in the morning or midday. There's some brain health benefits. Most of the data on this comes from animal data, which I'm a little reticent to share until it really gels into good human trials. Yes. Me? Yes. So I just want to ask a question about your food pyramid and nut nuts, and especially like uh -huh. you gave some the cashew cream and stuff at home. Is that how much of a nut part of the pyramid or your yeah. top part of the pyramid? Yeah, it would be, that would be nuts. We can go back to that. You can get your nuts through nut-based milk or cheese. Yeah, the, the serving size for nuts is a quarter cup, four to five times a week. And that could be two tablespoons of almond butter, okay? Or it could be a half a cup of nut milk, or a cup of nut milk. That's, but the problem with, I didn't specify it in the book because nut milks are all different. If it's the nut milk that I make, I know how, much, how many almonds are in it. If it's the stuff that you buy, like Blue Diamond, very few almonds, like almost no almonds. <laughs> so I, I was really hesitant to say, like, oh yeah, you can get nut milk, and you know that's a serving of nuts. It's it's really not true. And tofu yeah. comes under the beans and legumes. Yes, yes, soy foods go under beans and legumes. You didn't mention kefir. Is that something? Kefir is a fermented food, yeah. and it's a fermented dairy product, but it can also be plant-based. Kefir is probably one of the most rich sources of probiotic bacteria for your health. And so we should all be you know, consuming fermented food. And, okay. and this is a really good way to get it if you like it. I have a recipe in the book for a kefir, sort of a green goddess dressing using kefir. I really like it. But I'm not someone who's going to drink kefir, so I'm not. Just, you know, if you guys like it, go for it. Just not a kefir drinker. Yes. Yeah. Do statins affect brain health? This is such a good question because it's been debated over the years. A few decades ago, there was a scare, and it was a, it was a study that was just poorly done, um, and it said that statins are bad for brain health. People that take statins for their, to lower their cholesterol, they actually get more dementia, and it's not true. It's been disproved. Peter Atia did a recent podcast on that. Do you guys all know Peter Atia? Yeah. So he broke down all that stuff recently about statin drugs. If you go to see a doctor um, and they talk to you about cholesterol and they suggest statins, you notice that doctors are like so gung-ho on statins. It's not because they're making any money off of prescribing statins. It's because the data is so clear that people that go on statins and lower the cholesterol have less heart attacks, they have less strokes. And now we know there's brain health benefit and less Alzheimer's. It's just like one of the most successful drugs in history for reducing you know, how many people die from heart disease. So in, our, in doctors' minds, it's kind of a no-brainer. People are resistant to it, and some people do have side effects. You know, but um, for brain health, it's positive. Yes? One thing you didn't address, maybe you can just point it out, is high blood pressure. Oh, high blood pressure. Yeah, we didn't really talk about a lot of the um, medical things, but one of the things that you want to be paying attention to is we know that elevated blood pressure, especially at midlife, between the ages of 45 and 65, can have an impact on your dementia later. So even borderline high blood pressure in your 40s and 50s and 60s can increase your risk of dementia later. A lot of the studies that we have, that you know, a lot of the studies I've been quoting, look at these midlife decades and what, what your health is like 
What's your cholesterol like? What's your blood sugar? What's your high blood pressure? What's your weight? Are you at a healthy weight? All of these things have impact later. And blood pressure is one that's easy to measure. Um, you know, the parameters for blood pressure have changed since Jeannie and I were in practice. It used to be 140 over 90 was the top. Now it's 130 over 80. So you want your top number to be under 130. Okay, that's the important one. And if you go to your doctor and, you know, you've been running kind of high for a few years, your doctor might say, well, let's just watch it. Watch your salt exercise, you know. Um, that's really probably not the best recommendation in 2023. Um, the best recommendation is let's get that down as low as possible because you are at a vulnerable time for increasing your Alzheimer's risk. So sometimes you have to take it upon yourself to, you know, to really advocate for yourself that you know, my blood pressure is a little high and I'm worried about my brain health. I've read that it increases Alzheimer's risk. And you could buy a cuff and you could check it at home and you know, all these things. Yes? Quick follow up on that. I thought I saw a study that said there was a certain kind of blood pressure medication that actually decreased your Alzheimer's. There was. It just came out. Yes, I know. I can't remember the name of the drug. I don't either. Did you see it? I can't remember. I can't remember. No, I did see that. Um, yeah, there's, there was one in particular. Yes? Conversely, what about low, lower blood pressure? Um, the lower the better, as long as you're not passing out or dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say this from experience because my blood pressure, my blood pressure is so low that if I get up really, sometimes I wake up like you know ready to go. If I jump out of bed too fast, I will, I will pass out. Is that you? And so, you know, I don't talk about salt that much either. But cutting back on salt is one way to lower elevated blood pressure, right, or borderline blood pressure at midlife. But not everyone should cut back on salt. If you're someone like me who's got really low blood pressure, salt is like a nutrient that you need to consume. If you don't get enough of it, then you're, you're like tanking. Your blood volume is going down. Um, so it's an individual thing. In Jackson Hole, just like here, I'm sure you have a lot of athletes, a lot of people with very low blood pressure. A lot of people hit their head, like pass out and hit their head all over the time. <laughs> I've, I've done that. I've got scars. Um, yeah, so I pay attention to my salt intake in my, my volume, you know, my water intake. Yes? The balance between potassium and sodium uh -huh. um, in your diet is very high in potassium because of all the vegetables. So since we're getting a lot of potassium, maybe we don't have to restrict the sodium to lower our... It's a really good point. And also, you know, you're not eating any ultra-processed foods. You know, the um, typical American gets four times more salt than they need, okay? Um, but it's all from ultra-processed foods. It's from opening up a can of soup, or it's from going to McDonald's and having french fries. And like, imagine the sodium counts of these foods, right? Even just like, you know, minimally processed products have sometimes too much sodium. So if you're cutting out the ultra processed foods and you're leaning on whole foods for most of what you eat, you know, you can salt liberally. My, depending on, you know, your blood pressure. My, my recipes are generally low in salt, but I always give the option at the end to add a high flavorful, high mineral salt like Maldone. Yeah. Yeah, salt's, salt's a good topic. I think we're good. Yeah, you guys, have, you guys are like amazing. Thank you so much.